Bomb Smack. All right, so um, I was doing some research with um, Marxism and theology. So I went to uh, the channel um, Conversations That Matter with John Harris. And um, they had a, uh, a session with uh, Russell Fuller. Now, uh, Russell Fuller was involved in a uh, seminary scandal of sorts. He had uh, basically become the whistleblower that uh, critical race theory was being taught at the Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. And critical race theory is a uh, section of Marxism. And uh, basically it showed that um, the seminary was kind of moving leftward. Now, um, they fired him because he was against critical race theory. And they tried to get him to sign a um, non-disclosure agreement, but he refused, so he got to... Really, at that point, he got to blow the whistle. So... Um, you know, he was kind of dealing with that situation, and, you know, his behavior there was rather heroic, um, that he, uh, basically stood on his principles and, you know, kind of let the world know what was going on. Uh, we got to interview him, uh, through, uh, um, television program, um, a little late tonight. <laughs> T-R-O-T-N, the rest of the news. So, anyhow, a uh, really nice guy, really well thought, well spoken uh, fella. And um, they decided to do a show on a controversy of uh, theology proper. Now, uh, basically, um, there is an issue where uh, when we think about theology, um, the question is, are we thinking of it as Catholics or as New Testament Christians? Because there's a different, there's a definite difference of worldview in how you analyze things. So, uh, the Catholic Church typically, um, operates thinking of itself as a series of theologians and not the common people. Uh, it elevates the hierarchy over the laity. And so they assume that the will of the church is the will of the doctors and clergy or whatever. And eventually that goes down to um, the papacy, you know, which would be the supreme ecclesiastical authority. And so you're kind of like, you are dragged into the church, you know, not even willfully, because a lot of times you get baptized as a baby. But you're you're a part of that system like you're on the insurance plan. And you have nothing to do with the actual day-to-day -day operation. So, um, whereas the Baptist Church is a regenerate church of saints, uh, we at Born Again... The Holy Spirit sanctifies us, therefore we become a saint, not because of uh, the acts that we've done or achieved, but because of the acts that Jesus Christ achieved that was applied to us through the Holy Spirit, uh, making us born again um, as a result of faith. Now, um, I wanted to kind of go over uh, some of these things. Uh, the two things, one that would like be more conservative evangelical Protestant, which is that, you know, uh, Reformed, Protestant, New Testament, Christian, Bibliology 101, is that all the creeds are judged by the Scripture. Now, what we have seen with the Reformed theology is a mutation. Okay, they have gone away from that concept, and now they have developed... Uh, Roman Catholic theology on a lot of different issues and topics. Um, this kind of was done a lot through the work of Cornelius Van Til, 
uh, Van Til would confuse the categories. And with Van Til, he does not believe that the scriptures are actually that clear, that the sinful nature has affected man's ability to know or discern things. And some of this is a result of creaturely status. So even if you get saved or born again, you're not able to come to the truth. So, um, you know, with the scriptures, uh, we have uh, a paradox. You know, God reveals it, but we can't understand it. And so with the paradox of us not being able to understand the Bible, then it makes it so that we're not able to understand systematic theology. So Cornelius Van Til, he would fuse together the Trinity, he was very close to modalism. Uh, modalism is recognized as a heresy. So, you know, you only have one person of God instead of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. They would just say that there are manifestations, they're almost kind of like God's wearing a mask. Now I'm a Father, now I'm a Son, now I'm a Holy Spirit. So, um, you know, those concepts get fused together. I think some of that actually comes from this thing called the Athanasian Creed, which became a very strong confession in Roman Catholic theology proper. Um, so the assumption is that we're supposed to go along with Roman Catholic philosophy and, the, and therefore theology proper. Um, instead of going to the scripture. And Russell Fuller, I think that um, he's well-meaning and he's a nice guy to talk to, but I think that he's naive. And where does that naivete come from? Well, he is um, not using his scriptural knowledge. You know, he's an Old Testament professor. There's plenty of Old Testament passages that he could have talked about in this talk. I don't recall very many at all uh, scriptures that he used, specifically not as justification. You might have kind of basically you know, paraphrased a concept here or there, but uh, for him, it was these Roman Catholic axioms and how everything was hinging on accepting each creed and then running with it. The problem is, is that the, the creeds don't have the authority. Why don't they have authority? Well, we know that early on in Catholic history, they uh, created a doctrine of sacraments that contradicts what the Bible teaches about baptism and the Lord's Supper, among some other things. So, baptism is something willful, it involves repentance, it involves belief, and, you know, is ultimately in the macro, it is conversion. So, when you look at the sacrament of Roman Catholic baptism, you find a totally different symbol for the whole process. They want to sprinkle. And supposedly, maybe the sprinkling is the sprinkling of the Holy Spirit. Uh, but it's just not there, you know. Um, when we think of baptism, we're thinking of immersion. That is the common word. Baptizo is the Greek word, and it is transliterated to the Greekism um, Baptist, okay, or baptize. So, um, with that, uh, the entrance into the Christian religion is through baptism, and the baptism is a wolf process, and it's a surrendering of self. You are dying to self, realizing that Jesus is in charge, that he's Lord, and that you need his forgiveness of sins, and that essentially as you go down and die, God will come back and raise you up. Just as Jesus was resurrected, you will one day be resurrected. Now, um, 
that's a big shift. Because there are people born who get sprinkled without even knowing or talking or discussing, without really understanding the gospel. Simply, um, they're a member. Well, what if they get sprinkled as a baby and say, okay, well, I was born again at that age and nobody ever contradicted me on it. So when you say you must be born again, you must believe in Romans 10, believe in your heart. You know, um, you have to hear, you have to understand, you have to believe in your heart and repent of unbelief. So that's not occurring in the life of a Roman Catholic, at least um, not naturally occurring. Because they're being taught to follow tradition, to repeat, without any like initiation of their own will. So there's no cooperation. So, basically, um, Jesus said, call no man father, for only one is your father in heaven. And he also says, call no man master. Or, you know. Um, the Pharisees, they walk around wanting to be called a rabbi and um, be seated in the nicer places. Um, this is something that defiles the whole theological process. We saw this um, a lot in the congregational churches in the early American colonies as they would establish a halfway covenant where people were baptized as babies and were not obligated to believe in Jesus Christ and convert. So, you have a um, body that is not signed on to salvation, determining what faith is and what it shall be. So, there are some problems um, and they're focused on an issue called eternal subordination. Eternal subordination says that the persons of the uh, Godhead have a hierarchy. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, Fuller wants to act like this is something new to all of Christianity. But actually it's within the pale of, you know, Christian tradition. Because orthodoxy starts off with Eastern Orthodoxy, which is uh, teaching subordination. That the Father is not equal with the Son and the Holy Spirit, that he's advanced in his substance or his abilities. So the Father would be stronger than the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, we don't believe that. We don't believe in an ontological subordination. But Origen, the theologian, did. And there was a guy named Eusebius. And Eusebius um, basically went to a church that was organized under um, Clement of Ander Alexandria a century or two earlier. And they had a creed that said that Jesus was begotten in eternity past. Now, this idea of eternal generation uh, becomes part of the process and really, to me, ruins the rest of theology proper in the Roman Catholic Church, which I go through in an article. It's really long. I'll, I'll probably post it on at some point. But basically... Um, these, these different axioms are interacting with each other. And the problem is they act as if it's a replacement for the revelation of Scripture. And it's just not. Because whatever you propose is not exhaustive of what could be proposed. It's just your personal, you know, situational view of philosophy dealing with God. So, uh, there's always been... Uh, some argument of subordination. It's not new. But uh, could it be new that, you know, Protestants 
are going there that they're kind of like, okay, let's check this out. So the um, the movement, um, I don't believe it's necessarily wrong, but some of these other axioms that are put into with basically the Roman Catholic theology proper. Okay, with that uh, philosophy and understanding, then um, even what they propose, even though I don't disagree with it, isolate it. I might actually disagree with it in terms of that system. So um, the uh, different stages of, um, I think it was the seven ecumenical councils, you have just pages and pages of information where they create different formulas. <coughs> and different groups will accept and reject various councils. But uh, the assumption by reformers is that we have to go through the Roman Catholic formulation of these things. The truth is, they don't always go along with that themselves. Um, I think I'd have to go back and remember this. There was a controversy over two wills versus one will, and the reformers were not going along with some of the later uh, ecumenical creeds on various topics. Which, you know, modern New Calvinists are dumb and they don't know about that. I say that just because... Uh, Typically, their spirituality is to assume that they have a higher knowledge than anyone who's not part of the cult. And that's just a Roman Catholic tradition. Roman Catholics call everybody who's not Roman Catholic Protestant. Well, that doesn't mean that, you know, we actually are following some set model. They would say, you see, you're failing to do it. Nobody was, you know, I mean, the people who were trying to do that were not unified either, you know. So, um, you know, they say, oh yeah, there's fractures. But in truth, there's just as many fractures um, within the Roman Catholic Church that just kind of glued and duct taped together. Uh, lots of contradictory philosophies. There's a lot of mystics in the Catholic Church. There's a lot of evolutionists in the Catholic Church. There are some fundamentalists in the Catholic Church. And these philosophies contradict each other all the time. But they still kind of have the gold badge, so I'm like, okay, die. <laughs> um, but these things need to be judged by the scripture. So um, basically, he, he melds these things together. Um, I haven't spent a huge amount of deep time with Russell Fuller on this stuff, so I don't know where he's coming from. I do know that, like, you know, there's something funny when you've got a guy who's an Old Testament professor and going outside of his tradition to establish an orthodoxy. You know, you would think that he would have a lot of Old Testament passages to talk about. I do. We'll talk about those in a minute. Uh, but no, he has, I believe, because of textual critical training, he's not dependent on specifically, here's the Bible says here, here's the Bible says there. He's going along with a theological formula against systematic theologians. Well, they're kind of, it's more their area. And, you know, the problem is, is that they are contradicting. Um, Baptist theology. Now, this is a problem that Southerns had since I started there back in 2000. Let's see here. Actually, 1999 is when I started studying there. But the reason is, is because when they took over, they had, uh, you know, moderate liberalism. They had to deal with, but there were other traditions in the FCBC that were not being represented by the academics. And so within that, <coughs> they just didn't speak that language. They would speak about Reformed theology. So my problem there is, for instance, um, they went to Reformed theology, 
as opposed to traditional Baptist Calvinism. You go there and you could probably ask people right now, tell me what you think about Tom Sowes. And um, probably a large chunk of them won't know who he is. But some will. They sure won't have a whole lot to say about him. They could tell you, you know, I, I used to be able to sit down and tell you uh, Luther's autobiography as if it was another book of the gospel. But, you know, you didn't have a whole lot of information to deal with the actual founders of, um, you know, the monarchy of, monarchy, the ideology of Baptist, which I would say the ideology of New Testament Christian because there's an assumption there. Uh, they want to assume, part of their ideology, that they are Roman Catholics who just modified their views. So, you know, they'd say, we're part of the English separatist movement. Well, yes, but that's not the only tradition being represented among Baptists. Um, you know, the first Baptist, as far as with that name, spent a lot of time around the Anabaptist movement and tried to become an Anabaptist pastor because of slight disagreements on government where they like limited government, but they said, like, you know, hey, you can be a part of the government. Uh, the Anabaptists were not down with that. They wanted a total separation. Um, so because of that, they say, oh, yeah, they're, they're all English separatists, but there had actually been... Uh, some reports that there were hundreds of Dutch Anabaptists who had immigrated to England by that point. And there's a lot of confusion. The word Baptist, um, I've got some record of uh, people being called Baptist before John Smith, um, you know, by inquisitors and stuff. So in that, that, that can be pretty easily done because you have Anabaptist, and you might just want to shorten that a little bit. But the big core is this idea of regenerate church membership. You know, and so, like, Jesus said, you know, you don't pour new wineskin into, um, you don't pour new wine into old wineskins. Well, it's the same thing. Um, they have an ecclesiastical structure that's based on pagan Rome. You know, the Pontifex Maximus the cardinals, you know, these were uh, the aspects of the Roman Empire and how they structured their government. So, when they deal this stuff out, it is not biblically based. Now, a lot of the points were biblical, thank God. You know, so the gist of the Trinity and the Incarnation, I totally 100% support. But I noticed little nuances. So, like when we talk about baptism, and they say baptism for the remission of sins. Now, I interpret the scripture passages differently than they do, but I know that their interpretation is going to say that they believe in uh, baptismal regeneration to some degree. And then by the time you get to the Athanasian Creed, they declare that, you know, it's going to be, you're going to be judged on your works. And so, um, if they're trying to be judged by the works, and you look at Galatians, or you look at Romans 10, you know, the Jews were cursed because they were trying to establish their own righteousness within their flesh, instead of um, trusting Christ for an imputation of Christ's righteousness. Okay, let's see here. So, the big deal that he's complaining about is the idea of the three wills of God. And the internal subordination guys, um, Wayne Grudem, who I know he doesn't touch on as much, but I just forgot the theolo Bruce Ware, okay. And I think, um, I think the last guy, was it Stratton, Stratton or something? Anyway, you can do it when you look at the video. So, you know, they, they tried to not go there, but some of the more intense theologians found that they were uh, disagreeing with the Athanasian Creed concerning the simplicity of the Godhead. The simplicity of the Godhead says that, okay, we share the same substance, and since we share the same substance, we share the same will. 
And I see this is entirely wrong. As I said, I, I have my um, suspicions that maybe Van Til was involved. And um, I did a report on Van Til, and you know, there's various quotes where it's obvious that he uh, confuses persons and being. And, you know, just chops it up to another um, paradox. In other words, that for all intents and purposes, that it's contradictory. Well, if you can make just a, a real simple thing and say, no, a person is different from a being. Okay? Um, a tree is a being, and a tree is not a person. Now... He's wanting to go along with the Catholics and say that the will is an extension of the being. But a tree is a being, and a tree doesn't have a will. Because the will is going in no direction. A tree can grow. It doesn't think. It doesn't have emotions. Okay, so... Um, there's some reaction or whatever, but there's nothing to say that that's, you know, there is no conscious to it. We know that much. But yet, that's what they want. And so when he says, oh, they have three wills, and that's three different gods. Well, three persons is three persons, three different gods. Persons do have a will. You know, and so when we look at like Genesis, he says, um, 126, and God, that's Elohim, said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creature that creepeth upon the earth. So, here we see in creation of man, let us, it's not forcing anybody, it's agreement, okay? But if there's agreement, then there are several that are agreeing. And that means that there are several persons. It's not one person, because one person is not going to think, let us. We are grabbing this pen right now. Do I, I sound like a lunatic when I say that. No, these are different persons. And, you know, the will might be um, unified in opinion. So I don't think God's going to disagree with himself. I think that the will is expressed in different ways. Because I also believe that God operates in three different planes. The Father typically uses his office in the realm of the transcendent. Before there was time, or before the foundation of the earth, God did blah, blah, blah. And he has these decrees and election. Now, my interpretation of election is going to be different from theirs. And maybe decree, just kind of depending on the Calvinist. But basically, um, the thing is, is that, like, these are, um, you have that transcendent realm. But God is not simply the God of deism where it's only transcendent. And it kind of gets close to that when it comes to the Bardians, or what we call Neo-Orthodox. And I know, it's new guys of theology are not going to get this. And it was hilarious because, like, you know, watching um, Fuller go over the concepts with um, John um, Harris, and John was just kind of like, <laughs> you know, and <coughs> it's not an easy road, okay? That's why, you know, once we get past that basic level, of theology, you know, one God, 
You know, one Godhead, one divinity, one simplicity. All right. And then three persons. And by the way, um, divine simplicity, I'm in agreement with when we look at the Nicene Creed. But by the time we get to the Athanasian Creed, there's a removal of personal distinctions. For instance, in um, Corinthians, I think it's chapter 13, we'll see how the Father goes under the title, the personal title of God, and the Son is under the personal title of Lord. So there are personal distinctions, but in Athanasian Creed, they're all Lord. They're all God. So the titles <coughs> are bearing no personal distinction. And they want to go by the Roman Catholic the philosophy, which originally, before you get to the Nicene Creed, the wording in the Creed of the Caesarean Creed, okay, which is prior to the Nicene Creed, and what the Nicene Creed bases a lot of its stuff on, promotes subordinationism. Because it came straight from origin. And Origen thought that the Son and the Spirit were as far away from the Father as they were from creation. So, you know, you got a real subordination, which is kind of like a panentheism. You know, you have a high deity within, you know, a big pantheism. And so, uh, that's a that's a no-no. Um, but when we're dealing with these concepts... You know, the Catholic mindset is to arrange all the heresies as boundaries. And so it gets very confusing for somebody new to it. And Fuller is kind of careful on this note. Because, um, you know, when he says heresy, he's talking, you know, heresy in terms of a teacher and what should be the right teaching. As opposed to heresy like, I deny that Jesus is Lord and, you know, what's wrong with that? Well, if you're not believing that Jesus is the Lord, then how can he save you and you're not believing him to save you? You're trying to work your way to heaven on your own righteousness. Okay, so basically he's not saying that it's a cult heresy. He's more saying that it's a teaching heresy. And that's fine. Um, but he wants to say that there's only one will because of tritheism. And I don't think that's rational. Uh, you have three persons. Three persons are three wills. And there is one God. And, you know, the danger is that, and I've seen a lot of EOC guys and also some Roman Catholics who get after uh, Reformed um, Christology. I might as well just say this is probably a high level, level type of conversation, but Anyhow, they do have this high level of Christology. But the problem is, is that re Reformers can kind of veer off into what we call an Nestorian Christology, where the uh, humanity is completely separated from the deity. And Nestorius, I, I think this was an accident. I don't think he really intended it this way. But basically... Um, he wanted to make sure there is a complete, you know, God nature and there's a complete human nature. And they were so complete that they ended up being two people. And so he gave a illustration where it's like the two natures are marrying. But that sounds a whole lot like Gnosticism, where, you know, uh, Jesus is adopted by the deity. And so, you know, they're like, okay, well, that's heresy. So, <coughs> that's the problem with that method. It's all reactionary, reactionary, let's play some ping pong. Uh, instead of let's search out what Scripture's teaching. So, um, yeah, um, true Baptist theology should not go there, okay? Now, let me hit another passage. Controversial for those in text criticism. Uh, I wrote my book and dealt with a lot of the argumentation. And 
I've probably got a couple different YouTube videos if people are interested where I defend it. But basically, First uh, John five seven. Okay. So this is for there are three that bear record in heaven: the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. So there are three that bear the record. There are three testimonies. It's not just two testimonies. I mean, there is two from, you know, when John wrote his gospel, you know, but basically uh, there's three all together. The Father, the Word, or in Greek that's the Logos, and the Spirit. But these three are one. Or it says these three agree in one. So, there you go, agree. It's kind of a willful inclusion there. Um, if we received the witness of men, the witness of God is greater, for this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. If he that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself, he that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believes not the record that God gave his Son. Oh, I wanted to hit that. But. All right. Um, in minute 112, uh, 30 to 42 seconds. So you go to the video 11, uh, sorry, not 11. In one hour, 12 minutes, 30 seconds to 42 seconds. He will espouse modalism. Once again, I think that's a slip. And that's okay. I can have grace for that because this is a very technical issue. But that also does kind of put us in an area where we need to be careful. If Roman Catholic systematic, systematic theology was so great, it really would allow for justification by God's grace through faith alone. Just to be honest. Okay? It is failed. They didn't get God right because if they got God right, then they would have got the gospel right. They didn't get the gospel right because they didn't get God right. Which is likely because you have these different philosophical systems in each different creed. And these creeds do contradict each other at times. As these are man-made philosophies. Um, I don't fault reformers for having a Roman Catholic theology proper. Um, with the exception of the fact that um, it is an error. And those, you know, in the higher ranks should, you know, understand that because it's causing them other theological problems. Now, you know, as I said, I think that, you know, there's still likelihood that Fuller has valid criticisms of the um, eternal, what do we call it, eternal subordination. Because the subordination of eternal generation is ontological. And that's why I think it's wrong. I think that the Son of God is a reference to the Incarnation, not to the Logos. I don't think that God the Father is generating the Logos. And if he is, then that's an ontological subordination, which maybe was what it was originally intended by origin. So, you know, we need to get rid of that and then we can understand a personal subordination. And maybe Fuller is not understanding a personal subordination because of that Catholic catch-all. And these theologians were basically secretly drifting off to my opinion, which Fuller thinks is, you know, an academic heresy. Um, so what? 
<laughs> Bring it, big boy. <laughs> and I, I mean that just because I know he's a nice guy. He would, he would say things. He'd probably tell me he's concerned about my theology here, and he disagree. But essentially, I'm on the solid rock of scripture. If you want to convince me, you got to use scripture. So, um, you know, that's kind of the state of the union. And you see, Baptists, they would not have deep confessions on the Trinity. And sometimes that does mess things up. Um, they were right when there were some really poor confessions made of the Trinity where the Trinity was three parts instead of three persons. And there have been some Baptists in the South who really got a pathetic understanding of the Trinity. Now, when I think of Baptist theology proper, I think that what it was intended for was to limit the scope of not to limit the understanding. And what I mean by that is that when I hear a Baptist minister run his flippity floppity gums and say, It's a great mystery. We'll never understand it. Woo, it's the void. Don't step out into the void. But you gotta believe it. God is not the author of confusion. Okay? It's about understanding. Even the Logos, the word Logos is about understanding. Whatever God takes the time to reveal can be understood. Probably, you know, many of this stuff requires years of discipleship and training. Granted that. Okay? Um, but... It can be understood. And typically what we see in the um, Catholic education is that kids are taught to recite this stuff and not necessarily agree to it, but just adhere to tradition. And tradition does not lead to conviction, at least not most of the time. So, um, that's, that's a problem, and so we need to, you know, not simply reform, but radically reform, as in the Anabaptist. Um, you know, hold everything up to the light of Scripture. The, the Scriptures have revealed that there are three persons. The Scriptures have revealed that the Godhead slash divinity, the one being, the essence is one essence. There is one God in essence. But you don't want to either A, go into modalism, or B, a quadrinity. Okay, and sometimes when they show you the flux capacitor, all right, it's a picture of a, of a pyramid saying, okay, God is this, he's not that, God is this, he's not that. And here's the God in the middle, and here's the Father up here, the Son, the Spirit. You know, I, I think that that kind of, perhaps accidentally, leads into idolatry. Because it's an image, and the image is not quite as accurate as people would like. You know, who'd have thunk that, you know, I would disagree with making God look like a pyramid, right? But, um... Yeah, essentially, when we get to the Trinity, we have um, uh, one, um, one essence, one divinity, and then three persons. And the will is a product of the person. Uh, I, I believe, and, you know, I'm, I'll give a copy of this to Russell Fuller. Um, so, you know... I mean, he might just say, you're a heretic, you know. Um, you know, which, as I said, I'm not, you know, I don't care, all right. I, I've been through the gospel ghetto, all right. You, you know, you bring it, all right. But my understanding is based on scripture, and you're going to have to argue this stuff scripturally. And if you can't, you're not winning me over, okay. Um, at the same time, 
he is, you know, a very cordial guy. So, you know, he might not kind of go that way at all. Um, but, you know, heresy cannot be determined from philosophy. It has to be determined from discipleship through revelation. All right. Um, is there anything else? I, I did kind of record this a little later. I wrote down notes and then this a little later. Okay. All right. Sounds good. All right. We'll catch you later.